Oh, I'm so happy to see our guest, Zarina Zabriskie. She, of course, requires really no introduction because Zarina has been on our show more than any other guest. Um, not only do we love and appreciate her, but she has been reporting live from Ukraine for a couple of years now. And I left the house, walked about 30 meters and heard the sound of drone. I looked up, saw a drone, but it turned out that it was flying the other direction. I hid by my neighbor's fence, but it saw me and started moving towards me quickly. I started to run. I got lucky. I ran away. Where did you run? Across the street to a big building. Did you hide there? I hid there. And it turned around, returned to where I was hiding and blew up there. It thought maybe someone else was hiding there. How long did it take? Less than a minute. How did you know it was there? I heard it. It buzzing quite hard. When it has explosives, it buzzes. Was it scary? Of course. I've never run like this in my whole entire life. How often do you have these drones? Practically every day, two, three times. I'm always so happy to see you, but my heart is always like hurting because I realize that you have been documenting, you know, suffering for years now. And I told you in private that I even have trouble when I'm on your Twitter feed, you know, liking or retweeting posts because my heart is so heavy because I feel like we just can't do enough to end this fucking war and maybe just start there and then we'll get on to what's actually happening on the ground right now. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, dear members of the audience uh, in the States back home for me and around the world. I really appreciate you giving you Ukraine time of the day because the world is a busy place right now. There's a lot going on uh, and I wouldn't be grabbing your attention if it were not for an emergency. So thank you for being here and I hope to get about an hour of your time to discuss something very important. Okay, great. Just fire away, my friend. Uh, so, um, as you might know, or if you knew, I'll give a very, very brief um, nutshell analysis background. Uh, I'm in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has been invaded by the Russian Federation military on the 24th of February 2022. And the war has been going ever since. It is called a big war uh, or the full scale invasion because the actual war started in 2014 when the Russian Federation annexed the Crimea Peninsula and uh, started the proxy war in Donbass. So that is still going on. I am currently in a very close proximity to the Crimea Peninsula. I'm on the very front line in the front line city of Kherson, from where I report quite often, but not always. Uh, I also go to the Eastern and Northern Front and report from there. Uh, but right now I'm reporting something that we have not seen yet in this war, but as I hear, we have seen in other wars, another Russian signature move, another Russian war crime, namely uh, Russian military drones attack civilians knowingly and purposefully. Uh, and to be honest with you, I thought that my own ability to be shocked after two and a half years is kind of exhausted. And I didn't think that I could be shocked anymore. And that is not true. They do not, um, uh, they 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 never fail uh, to shock. Uh, and uh, as I arrived to Kherson, I realized that the scene has changed. There's still artillery uh, attacks daily and especially nightly. For instance, last night, uh, I actually developed a habit of waking up, tweeting 
there was an explosion and fallen right back to sleep, which is a ridiculous habit, of course, but I want it to be recorded. So last night there were about four attacks, very, very loud explosions close by. So that still is going on. There's still guided aerial bombs in the suburbs of Kherson and in the villages of the region, and not as much in the city of Kherson though. But there is this new development which makes walking down the street practically impossible. Uh, what it means and what you might have hard time imagining what I'm talking about, which is a normal reaction. In fact, I had to uh, have a little consultation with a military psychologist to see how should I deal with this report, because I have been met with a lot of disbelief and denial, which apparently is a normal reaction to this kind of horror level. A normal human psyche is not prepared to accept such kind of an existential threat. It's almost as a Holocaust or some sort of medieval horror level. Uh, or rather, uh, my association was a bad sci-fi movie or not necessarily bad, perhaps Terminator uh, with drones hunting humans. I did not know that was possible. Apparently it is. So the logistics are uh, simple. We are only about one kilometer away from the Russian positions because the front line here is the Dnipro River. It separates the city of Kherson, uh, which is called the right bank or the western bank of the Dnipro River from the left bank or the eastern bank, which is Russian occupied. So the Russians are very, very, very close. However, it is somewhat difficult for them to approach uh, the very bank because of the local terrain uh, peculiarities. Uh, it's a kind of a swampy part of the river, so heavy equipment can't make it to the very edge of the river. And it has been, well, not difficult. They still managed to pummel Kherson for the last two years, ever since it was liberated on 11th of November 2022, after nine months of occupation. However, it's becoming more and more difficult. Also, a lot of heavy equipment has been moved uh, to the eastern front, to Donbass, to Kharkiv region, to the north and uh, east of Ukraine, where the war is also going on. And um, with the last resources and with dwindling supplies of artillery shells, uh, the Russians have learned from Ukrainians what Ukrainians are doing very, very well, and that is innovation technologies and specifically drones. Right. So the Russians also have pretty good, as I hear, engineering stuff, uh, started to mimic uh, what Ukrainians used for the military purposes. Only, of course, with the way the Russian Federation fights, uh, they do not follow any conventions, Geneva Conventions, Rome Statute, or pretty much anything uh, that is accepted in the civilized world. Uh, on the contrary, uh, they like to weaponize fear. So here comes this uh, technique. Uh, they have two drones, uh, usually, and these are consumer drones. You might have it at home even to do some aerial videography or to shoot weddings or whatnot, you know, beautiful mountains. They're very light drones you can buy online. They're called FPV drones, first person view drones, and Mavic drones. They're slightly different. They're different uh, uh models and i'm not going to go heavily technical on you simply because i am actually not that technical myself i had to learn it and so what happens mavic drone has a better camera so it's a better surveillance drone it's it's scouting the territory looking initially supposedly for military targets although there are not that many here there are many uh civilians in the villages and in the city coastal areas of Kherson and downtown of Kherson. Um, the majority of people who are staying, those who couldn't leave 
often some underprivileged categories. There are a lot of handicapped people, uh, sick people, people who can't afford to move, uh, families with children. And uh, the drones or the Mavic drones are looking for the military goals, targets. Do not find them in most cases. And then the FPV drones, Drone, which follows the mapping drones, is being uh, forwarded, or they call corrected, you, you know, with a given a uh, target of a civilian. Uh, it could be a woman, it could be a child. Uh, yesterday, there was a 12-year-old in the village of Bilazorka. Two weeks ago, there were two sisters, 16 years old. Uh, one was severely injured. And it's going on every day, many times. Uh, the day before yesterday, uh, I counted 13 attacks and had eyewitnesses, multiple eyewitnesses on camera confirming that. I've seen the drones myself several times. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, the Ukrainian air defense has hard time stopping it, preventing it, and uh, defending the civilian population because the electronic warfare devices, units, are tuned to work with a certain frequency. And uh, it's not um, that easy to reprogram that. And Russians, knowing that, reprogram their drones, both types, Mavic and FPVs, to operate on different frequencies, which are unattainable for the electronic warfare units. And so it's, uh, as someone ex uh, explained it to me, it's almost like Swiss cheese, the electronic defense with a lot of holes. And so those drones, they are able to find these holes and penetrate the aerial wow. space over Kherson and Kherson region. And so what happens, you hear what they call skid, which literally means drop. Uh, and when, when everybody is used at this point to artillery attacks and missile attacks, and this has two step uh, program, so to say, or the sound. So we hear the outgoing, and because it's so close, you hear it, boom, and then a few seconds, and then it lands. And if it's close, you hear um, a whistle, and then you hear it landed. And people are used to it. It gives you a couple of seconds to regroup, to hide, not a lot, let's be honest here. But, you know, when you're used to something, it's not as scary anymore. And uh, the artillery attack is rarely uh, targeted personally. They just basically shoot in all over and it flies wherever and there's no rhyme or reason to it. The drone situation is the opposite. There are people on the other side, the Russian military, who are sitting there watching with Mavic and with FPV and seeing that they are targeting children, old ladies, old men, people on the bicycles, as someone put it, people walking their dogs, cars, uh, buses, public buses. All of this wow. is not a hearsay. I've seen pictures. I've seen the cars destroyed by this explosive. Uh, and uh, so knowingly and purposefully, they drop those explosives from the first person view drone from FPV drones on top of civilians, or sometimes the FPV drones would crush. They, they called kamikaze drones or suicidal drones because they oftentimes they perish. Although sometimes I hear they are capable of turning around and very quickly head back across the river. That's basically what's been happening. Uh, the shocking element here, of course, is the uh, um, determination to kill civilians, which is described as a war crime in, in multiple conventions, including Geneva Convention, the amendment to Geneva Convention from 1977, I believe, uh, the Rome Institute and uh, other conventions. Uh, the other shocking part is that it has not been reported at all. Like when I say at all, it means there was zero reporting on that. There are local journalists who are writing a local Telegram channel, which is a social platform here in Ukraine. Um, there's some 
mentions of it in the local Ukrainian newspapers. That's about it. I wrote an article uh, for Byline Times. God bless our editors who always pay attention to what's important. I can't say enough for our British newspaper, which is now leading, I think, the progressive forces uh, on the global scale. Uh, and it turned a lot of heads. There was a lot of reads went viral. Still, it is not enough. I've been kind of swapping, swamping the Twitter with interviews, video interviews with uh, survivors and eyewitnesses from children to uh, retirees. Uh, I do two, three, four a day, as many as I can get, because as you can imagine, getting them are not that easy because you right. have to go to places where the drones are hunting you uh, and you have to convince people uh, to talk to you uh, and people are afraid. They are right. really afraid, you know, they're, being, they're afraid to stay in the street, they're afraid to speak to journalists, uh, they're just generally afraid. And then I also have to translate them, and I do it as fast as I can, but it takes time. So if, uh, say, I wasn't a one-woman show, there would be many, many, many more of these interviews. And what I'm looking for, what I'm really grateful for for you guys is to help spread the word, to help get the uh, global community, uh, the um, international judiciary forces, or, or whoever is uh, capable or related to the subject, whoever can start looking at it and help stop it. Because yesterday there were 25 drops like that, only counted, not all of them are being counted. Today, when I stepped outside, somebody was trying to shoot down these drones from a hunter's rifle, which apparently is the best way to take them down wow. uh, because uh, it, it goes, you know, in a cloud of a, uh, of a what do you call it, the little, um, uh, it, because it has not bullets, but uh, anybody is hunting here. I, I, I'm not in the some, some sort of pellets. Yes, they're pallets. They're pallets, mm -hmm. and it creates the cloud of pallets, and it takes, it damages the drone. The drones fall, um, and that's not the way to to counter that. No. So, I'm here for anybody who has any connection to anybody who has any connection to help stop killing the people of Kherson. That's it. Oh my God, Zarina. Okay, one quick thing for me, and then Jim, jump in. What I want to ask you is, you've already made one film documenting war crimes um, in this war from the Russian aggressors. You also are currently working on another film that is showing the destruction that's occurring in Kherson. And in your experience understanding the world of combat propaganda, how much of this type of warfare is to instill fear in people? Because just hearing you say this puts me in a state of fear, just knowing that this is happening and knowing that this could be happening anywhere and that nothing's really being done. How much of this is also psychological? Obviously, we see people who've really been injured, so we know how real it is. But how much of this is to instill fear uh, in the population? Of course, Heidi, it's a great question. And it's a, as we know, it's a hybrid war. So the main purpose here is to scare people and weaponize the fear. Uh, because as many people as they can injure and kill, they can't kill them all with the drones, although God knows they're trying. But the intent is to um, move people away from make people leave here so on, make people abandon their cities. And okay. Ukrainians are very stubborn, so they're not easily scared. Uh, but uh, they, they are scared to be in the street, but they're not scared to to enough to leave their city. They, they love their city. They consider it their Ukrainian city and they don't want to leave. But that's the intent. Uh, we also know that that is what's happening because of another Russian tactic, which is called double tap. I believe we spoke about it on some of the previous show. Uh, the Russians have been using it in Chechen war, in Georgia, in Syria. And that is... Um, First, uh, they target humanitarian center or a store or a place where there's conglomeration of civilians. And it could be artillery or it could be an FPV drone. Uh, it could be a missile. And then they're injured and there's rubble. And the first responders arrive 
to help uh, the injured to get the bodies from underneath the rubble. And at this point, there is a second attack. They are actually waiting for the ambulances, for firefighters, uh, for technicians to arrive to hit and kill the first responders, which is another war crime. It's again against the convention uh, and any co conventions accepted by the civilized world. Uh, so this double tap, I've observed it myself. I've re reported from double taps where I had to throw myself on the ground. That makes reporting much more difficult because the authorities here uh, don't let even the local journalist uh, to the site of the destruction, perhaps fearing for our lives, but which I mean, thanks, but this is our job and it gets underreported. I've re I've tried to report from several places where I wasn't allowed to go and these were civilian objects. There was nothing military there. And um, there were other cases where there were civilian objects with no militaries whatsoever because I'd been there, examined them, I filmed it, there would be a double tap and then I wouldn't be allowed to share that uh, out of um, precautions, which sometimes are overdoing it. Wow, Jim. Um, uh, yeah, you, you, thank you for that reporting. Um, it's really important and I, I'm going to do everything I can to amplify this. Um, it, it, this is the nightmare that I have been worried about for a very long time. Um, and I've been listening very closely to people in America, people like Eric Prince and people like that who have been saying, well, the war is going to turn because the Russians now have um, improved on the Ukrainians' drone capabilities. So I immediately, I, I, I've been listening to them sort of project this for months. And so hearing you report it from the ground is, is absolutely horrifying and terrifying to me. And I'm, I'm just incredibly sorry um, for what you're going through and what Ukraine is going through right now. Um, is the Ukrainian military um, aware and, and trying to come up with countermeasures to this? Of course. I mean, Ukrainian uh, military have been on top of that and leading in this area for a long time, for the whole course of the war. And they're still on top and they're still leading. Uh, but they have been uh, talking to me uh, um, during the interviews and uh, telling me that it's becoming more and more difficult because of this frequency situation that I have described. Yeah. And it's becoming a little bit like a cat and mice, you know, hide and seek, you know, whoever is there first. So um, Ukrainians are also not sitting there dwindling, you know, like uh, twindling their fingers. They they are working on the radio defense and not just the military. There are a lot of volunteers and engineers and um, it's a very creative uh, town. There are a lot of talent here. I've seen a lot of devices and creations they are trying different things but they're behind because they simply don't have as many resources as russians do russia is the biggest country in the world they're still selling gas and oil uh, to europe and globally they are still buying uh, the chips and cheap parts from china and even though there are sanctions which are by the way very helpful and should not be uh, banned or stopped in any way despite of what uh, uh, recently uh, the uh, people who escaped russia but uh, endured very very hard stockholm syndrome are now yeah. propagating and uh, we, we shouldn't be listening to that. They're very traumatized people, unfortunately. Uh, the sanctions are working, but there are ways around sanctions. And there are third countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan uh, involved. And so uh, the market in Russia is still rich for these parts and they're able to build them. Plus, I watched some videos, uh, do-it-yourself videos that they are proudly sharing on their channels. Uh, and Ukrainian military showed them to me. Uh, the Russians are building 
like do in a do-it-yourself manner from God only knows what, from some sticks and wires, they're building more and more flying devices with, you know, with a, a scotch tape attached to them. This is, we're not talking about high technology here, guys. We are talking about uh, what was described to me as a, a and a Coca-Cola uh, can dangling from the uh, toy uh, um, drone. Yeah. Uh, anyone can do it. I, I don't know. You know, like whoever has kids, their kids could do it. And that, and that, that's, yeah, that's there are a few hundred bucks. I mean, you can you can buy them online anytime you want. Um, that's what makes this so dangerous. Um, and it's it's very scary that they have they've managed to to do. I, it doesn't surprise me they figured out how to get around electronic warfare but um yeah it's a uh, th this i mean terminator has been uh the nightmare for a very long time right drones flying around with guns on them um and unfortunately that's going to be next um i did not think that i would see it with my own eyes uh in my lifetime and nevertheless i do this is not to mention the shaheed drones which yes. are Iranian drones and they're still here they're still here every night the other night I was taking my laundry on the little balcony you see behind me I have a very cute little terrace never mind that the windows are all shattered one part is covered with a cardboard which is the typical story here now Kherson has been called the city of wooden windows because pretty much oh. everything is cardboarded. It is true. I'm actually intending of making a little video. I just didn't have time yet. Uh, and there are, you know, holes from shrapnel in these windows. But nevertheless, it's, it's a cute little place. And so I was putting my laundry up. And then I hear, sure enough, like, and then I hear the um, air defense shooting it down. So I filmed a little bit, but it was dark. I have a little video on Twitter, uh, how it feels from inside. And yeah. at some point it was so close that this curtain, this green curtain you see behind me, because I was standing behind it and went into my face like this, brush in my face. That's how close it was. And I have a friend uh, who's a Ukrainian journalist and photographer. So he climbed up on the roof uh, on his building. I, I don't have a roof here. I, I mean, I have a roof, but I can't get there, but he could. And he took amazing photographs that were then published by Reuters of the drone attacks and the um, air defense shooting them down. So that that's happening every night and all over Ukraine, not just here, but those are big drones. They yeah. are giant. They also create different type of damage, a lot of damage. Um, and we are talking about entirely different type of drones, small yet lethal, horrifying, dangerous. You know, I, as you're talking, there's two thoughts going through my head. One is how can you advise me to get tougher? Cause I feel so sad because I feel helpless. Like I don't know what to do. So that's well, one question I have. And I have another one for you. That's a very good question. It's understandable. Again, everything we do is psychology. I, I mean, first of all, consult with your therapist if you don't do therapy uh read some book uh if you don't do a book gee get the chat gpt and ask some you know psychological <laughs> guidance that works it takes two minutes uh, but it's all psychology and the lack of agency here of course will make you feel desperate uh, because you are also a person of action mm -hmm. so in, unable to do something about it makes you feel helpless and depressed. So I've been learning a lot from the people of Kherson because they lived through nine months of occupation and now uh, two years, two years from 22, yeah, almost two years of constant daily, hourly attacks, all sort of attacks, artillery is drawn to missile, right? Um, and they they are able to function. They go to work. They look great. Um, they do a lot of sports. One of the mm -hmm. things that I'm trying to do as I am covering this story, shocking story, is um, athletic here song. The gyms mm -hmm. are open. The other day I went to a boxing studio <laughs> where uh, people for age five, 
to age probably 70, we're all training together, doing like very serious boxing routines, you know, and, and have a physical training as well, uh, jumping ropes, you know, and then. That's doing... exactly what I need. That's what's missing. Yeah. I just need to start boxing. I mean, I really do. I'm serious. I'm like that is, that is mm -hmm. what I need to do. I need to mm -hmm. be able to like punch bags, skip rope, just one way of doing it. Of course, not everybody's going to box, but speaking of fitness, there are all sorts of dance classes, yoga classes, some of them in the basements because, you yeah. know, but some of them, the studio I go to is not in the basement. And yes, it's dangerous. And yes, uh, we do have shattered glass and yeah. it's been hit before, but it gives us such um, a relief and such sense of agency and control that you can in fact, have this inner order, no matter what's happening outside, even doing meditations during artillery uh, attack, when yeah. it, it, it's a matter of control. Uh, and then, of course, you know, people have health conditions, simply not everybody's into sports. Uh, they do a lot of um, uh, development, you know, people are gardening a lot, you know, you walk past a big crater and next to it you see a beautiful flower bed with wow. all sorts of flowers uh there are fruit trees everywhere wow. um, the uh, uh next door to me uh there's a young woman i met on the liberation day uh because her pillow was pierced with a piece of shrapnel as she was trying to take a, a nap and I happened to record her the day. And then what do you know? I happened to be her neighbor. Now I live next door, you know, in the next yeah. yard. So she paid, she tried to leave. Uh, she's about, she's in her early thirties and uh, has a young child uh, and many animals. And they left uh, to the Western Ukraine, uh, couldn't stay there, wanted to come home, miss their home, came back and now she, painted her, um, this is a block of apartments, right? So there's an entrance and a bunch of uh, apartments. She painted it with beautiful sakura. Mm. So you walk in and there's like all this, well, graffiti or frescoes or call mm -hmm. it what not. And she set uh, this, uh, a swimming pool, a rubber swimming pool for her son mm -hmm. under a tent so the drones can't see it. People go for walks uh, in the park. Uh, with their dogs, go for a run. Um, and uh, I, I was just invited to poetry reading, to read a poem next weekend, uh, because people do that as well. People help each other. I have yeah. a lot of people volunteer and help those who are bedridden, uh, help those who can't uh, cater to themselves. And there's like all, there are all kind of master classes, you know, right. the jewelry uh and they of course of course they collect and uh um, help the ukrainian military they raise funds uh they they collect some clothes or whatever they can to help their defenders so there's so many ways uh in which this experience from the people who should be exhausted and should be totally depressed and out of it but keep going that could be a role model to all of us no matter where we are so uh I, i'm not here in the position to give advice i'm just translating what yeah. i see here and offering you my observation and my experience from what I see trying to do or not even trying to do or doing something no I mean it, it already helps I, I it reminded me of you saying one of the key things that we have to do when we did that interview with you the hybrid warfare 101 where you said staying fit is part of how you fight this war and I needed to be reminded of that because the missing piece for me right now is that physical exertion which helps my head because he hearing what's happening and the Betty Dangerous community, my Substack community, we raise money to repair drones and, and buy a drone. And I remember being so proud, but what you are describing is just this endless fleet of drones. And that makes me feel like, you know, again, like I can't do enough and can't stay in action enough. But 
one thing I want to bring up, and then Jim, you ask any final question is, as I hear you talking, I realize the world has changed so much that social media is a virtual battlefield. Twitter right now, as you can imagine, is as evil a place in psychological warfare as it's ever been. And alternately, the physical warring world has changed too, to these little cheap, you know, pernicious, evil, a uh, couple hundred dollar pieces of equipment versus a battleship or whatever. And it seems like there's an, a, a parallel that we have to kind of start thinking about in both the virtual battlefield space, that social media space, and the changing kind of cheapness of war. And I'm just saying that out loud because as you've been speaking, I've been thinking about it, how we have to address this changing world and we have to do it quickly if we want to have a holistic world. Well, I of course, I think about it a lot. And um, as I think we discussed that before, we are very clearly in a paradigm shift. We are experiencing the uh, change in this tectonic layers of history. And we are not that original. It's not only happening to us. It happened to generations before us and those times. I'm actually reading this book. I have been reading it for a while because there's not that much to read, uh, but uh, this is called uh, Six Women Writers on the Front Lines of World War II. And it's a, just a unique way of um, talking about history from the point of view of uh, war journalists. And, you know, one of the reasons that it's my favorite book right now is because I read it and it feels like, oh, this is what's happening to me. This yeah. is exactly, precisely, you know, for 10 years it's been happening to me, but it's been happening to people who started as war journalists and first in the World War I and then in World War II, because some of them old enough who are doing it the second time around. Wow. And and, and that gives you a different perspective. We're not that original, you know, like we think, wow, we have artificial intelligence. We have uh, drones hunting. Uh, they had the flying devices at the time. They had electronic eavesdropping, yeah. uh, which was new to them. They had carpet bomb. They had very, very, very similar issues in so many ways. It just, the details are different. Yeah. But it always comes as a shock. And uh, in a way we're all, you know, stuck in this uh, Einstein's definition of insanity where we're repeating the same thing again and again, expecting something new. Why should we expect anything new? It's the same old uh, human psyche. And until we turn to psychology, until we realize that we are reinventing a bike, until we, we look deeper into ourselves, each one of us will be uh, flabbergasted with all these external developments again and again and again, like eternal return, you know. Uh, but it's not that, that I'm that clever and have any solutions. I don't. I am experiencing it just as anybody else. But my position is slightly different because I put myself in this unique situation where everything is just so extreme. So you experience things sharper, I think, and eventually I will experience more of a PTSD than, you know, you will experience it from being on Twitter. I will experience it from, from the physical uh, phenomena, you know, which I have here. But I mean, we can control it. We can do something about it. And that is constantly thinking, recognizing, being aware that yes, we are in a war situation, we're in a hybrid war, we have an enemy, we have the adversary, very strong adversary who is building this axis, just like in World War II, yes. we have the axis. And I don't wanna necessarily throw in words like evil or good or anything, everything is relevant, but it is a coalition. We have a coalition led by Russia, led by Putin with a completely brainwashed, 
nation of zombies, 99.9% brainwashed to the extent that the Nazi Germany was at the time. So we shouldn't ex expect changes anytime soon. And then we have other nations that for various reasons are joining in. We have BRICS, we have just, you know, shocks or whatever it is, like all this coalition where we have China, Iran, North Korea. Now we have uh, Venezuela on the brink. We have anybody who felt they are not fitting into existing order of the world is trying to join it for their own part. And th that is not going to stop anytime soon. We need to face it, we need to wake up, we need to address it. And our elected politicians, we should elect the politicians who are capable of addressing it. We shouldn't beat around the bush and, you know, like split hair and think, uh, which I see right now on social media from my American friends, uh, like deciding not to vote for the Democrats because of some personal dislike or memory association. This is precisely what is needed by our adversary. Our only hope right now is to put aside our doubts in personalities of the leaders, nobody is perfect ever, but to uh, get elected the party who actually can withstand and has a chance of not giving in to this adversary coalition. Uh, Jim. I just want to ask you, um, first of all, thank you again. Um, what, what are the specific messages, actions, what can our viewers and Heidi and I and anybody else um, that we can find, what is the sort of strategically the best way to expose this um, in, in America, let's say? Do you, have, do you have specific thoughts on who should we be targeting? Who should we be getting to pay attention to this that isn't what are the best ways of actually helping on the ground? Um, and we are uh, talking about the drone situation. The drones, the drones. yes. The yes. I'm, very, I'm very focused on the, on the drones. Yeah, right. well, I, I mean, it makes sense to frame it and speak about the big picture because that's what you usually of do course. on the show. You know, on some other show, it probably would be irrelevant, but here we always have the high war information warfare uh, in mind. So uh, we did not deviate. We stayed within our subject on a big scale. And now we're getting back to more practical measures. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think information, because this is the information warfare right now, is being silenced for whatever reasons. It's not um, that somebody's trying to silence it on purpose. It's just not enough coverage. I am the only foreign journalist based in Kherson at this moment due to multiple reasons. I'm not blaming anybody. It just sometimes it just happens to be so. So uh, I work a lot, but it, I one person is never enough. We need more people, more people, more journalists who are also people. We need professional journalists come here to cover the situation. This is not always possible. We need more interviews. I, I, I am recording. I have a lot of video material. I am sharing it. I can talk about it. I can get people on air who will talk about it. Um, anybody, if anybody is uh, connected with what we call um, mass media, main, you know, social media, uh, I, I am talking to a couple of big uh, mass media companies, publications next week, uh, but right. we need more, as many as, as possible. Uh, and uh, sharing, sharing it on Twitter, sharing it on Instagram. I don't have an Instagram account. I simply don't have time to lead, you know, in addition to a lot of activities on Twitter not a lot of activities on Facebook, but also reporting, writing articles, going around physically. I don't have time to do Instagram. It's not covered there. Maybe somebody can pick it up and you know repost all the videos, all the video interviews that I've done on Instagram, whoever has a big following there. I'm not represented on TikTok in any way. I've never been on TikTok and I hear it's a big pro program, platform, sorry. So 
maybe somebody can volunteer and just pick up those video right. in two minutes each. They can be cut. Uh, they are already translated. Pick them up, share them around. There's an article um, on byline time, share the article. It's a lot of facts and research. Uh, yeah. Tonight, there will be a show uh, airing with Phil Itner, who is our colleague uh, based in Kiev, a uh, former CBS news reporter. Uh, he's running his own show. Uh, we did an extensive coverage of this. Share Phil's show. Um, if you are running a YouTube show or a channel and doing this sort of show, let's talk. I'll talk about it. Yeah. I'll talk to anyone uh, to, to get this. We need to break the story. That's what we can do. Uh, the other uh, thing that is possible uh, is um, donation, of course. Uh, this is more difficult. I, I'm not... I'm not somebody who does fundraising. I'm a journalist. We typically don't do it. I can recommend uh, units, the army units here on the spot. I interviewed these people. I filmed them. I've been working with them for over a year. I see them at work. I know that they are fighting. I know that if you donate to this unit, this a territorial defense um, brigades from Kherson and Odessa. They are local, these are local people who are protecting their own land. Uh, yeah. They invested in getting to the left bank and free their relatives yeah. uh, and get their property, which is there. So they will not be spending this money on anything else. They will be spending them on drones. I can recommend them and put people in touch. That's possible. Um, there, you know, of course, there's a lot of injuries. Uh, I've actually got a list from a hospital and also from a medical unit. Uh, they need medication. They don't have enough medication. I have a list. If somebody wants to help with supplies, the particular items, I can send this list. Uh, and there, there are many, many, you know, somebody's into animals. There's so many injured animals here. And there's so many uh, shelters, animal shelters that are struggling. Uh, yeah. We once uh, got uh, a dog uh, which was injured during an interview. We, I was interviewing someone. Uh, and at this point, a car was going on a very high speed and injured a dog and we were able to get the dog and get it to the shelter so the dog is okay but you know veterinarians also need medications and stuff and these people are saints the volunteers yeah. who save the animals they uh they they do it on their own dime yeah. uh they do it under shell and under drones so here yeah. and of course the children it, it, there is just you know if you are so inclined uh, humanitarian or army support, I can put you in touch. I will not be doing any sort of fundraising of my own. I do journalism, but I can put you in touch with reliable people who've, whom I have personally seen working here, being decent people who could be trusted. Uh, Zarina can be contacted through her socials. There's something for everybody to do that feels incredibly empowering. That, that people can actually take action. So it's uh, very easy to find Zarina Zabriskie on her socials. Um, and thank you for that. And final sentence that you want to plant in people's heads that can help them as they try to explain this crisis to their networks. Like one final line that can really uh, help people clearly get the message across. Don't give up. Never give up. Stay strong. That's written on my yoga studio wall in English. I've in seen pain. that. I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. Never give up. Mm -hmm. Stay strong. You'll get there. We will get there. I believe it. They say it all the time. Все будет Украина. Everything will be Ukraine. And Ukraine here is not just Ukraine. It's more like we will get there. It, it will be the way we believe it should be, you know. Beautiful. And why don't we um, let some uh, people from Herson tell us directly through Zarina's video. Let's let's finish on the words of people in Herson. Russian military drones drop explosives on civilians in the city and suburb of Kherson. Kherson, 
Райони залітають дрони і скидають вибухівку на цивільних. Другий місяць над нами дрони. Відео, де моя дівчинка з мого кварталу, вони тікали від дрону, вони сховалися. Я знаходилась в самому центрі міста. Як тільки я зупинилась, вийшла з автомобіля, я почула звук. Вибухівка впала мені просто під ноги. Мене врятувало те, що не спрацювала вибухова частина. I left the house, walked about 30 meters and heard the sound of drone. I looked up, saw a drone, but it turned out that it was flying the other direction. I hid by my neighbor's fence, but it saw me and started moving towards me quickly. I started to run. I got lucky. I ran away. Where did you run? Across the street to a big building. Did you hide there? I hid there. And it turned around, returned to where I was hiding and blew up there. Шел по вулиці, відкрита місцевість була. Побачив мене дрон. Я намагався від нього втекти, бо скинули на мене гранату. І мене лише уламками трохи зачепило. Травма ноги, ну, вибух, мінно вибухова. Роботи під відкритим небом. І періодично приходиться по нескольку разів в день прятатися. Тому що зависають дрони, відбувають збороси. Бувають десятками пролітають дрони. Була на вулиці, повела кахову, дивлюсь, літить дрон. Я вийшов, і він прямо над нами пролетів. Я почула... Дрон. Ми забігли у гараж і буквально за декілька секунд був перший скид. Потім ще було п'ять або шість скидів. Ось от мене бомбосховище прилетіло. Чотири чоловіка ранено. Ми позвонили, сказали, що вибили машину. Ну тут сидів, прильот був, ото поранено, відсок нічого. Це йде сафарі на людей, ви розумієте? Ця історія не має відповідати на потрібність.